Our study on this occasion is entitled The Three Angels' Messages. In order to understand the th messages of the three angels in detail, we need to go into some background material first, because the three angels' messages talks about a day of judgment, and uh, linked with that is the question of the atonement. Seventh-day Adventists, as a denomination, are unique and that they have always maintained that the judgment referred to in Daniel 7, 9 to 14, is a pre-advent or investigative judgment, which takes place in heaven before the second coming. The gathering of the large multitude of angels recorded in these verses about the throne where the Ancient of Days sits can be understood in no other way. Most Christians do not interpret these verses in this way, Though in recent years, a small number of non-Adventist uh, Bible scholars have begun to accept that there will be a pre-Advent judgment, though they do not link it to the beginning in the year 1844, as we do. In Seventh-day Adventist theology and prophetic interpretation, this judgment in Daniel 7, 9 to 14 is linked with the cleansing of the sanctuary, mentioned in Daniel 8:14. In the early earthly sanctuary, the services involved the confessed sins that were recorded in it by the sprinkling of the blood of the sin offerings, and their records were to be removed once a year <clears throat> on a special day that was held called the Day of Atonement. The Lord's goat and the cape goat are described in the description in Leviticus chapter 16. And during the year, record of the sins confessed by the people of God were placed in the sanctuary, but on the Day of Atonement, the record was removed and placed upon the head of the scapegoat who took the record away from God's people. These services resulted in what has been called the cleansing of the sanctuary, and we have discussed that in previous lecture. The Day of Atonement was also known as the Day of Judgment. As Jews in ancient times were required on leading up to the Day of Judgment to make sure that their records were all up to date with God and every sin they knew about had been confessed. And if they did not sanctify themselves and enter into the services, they could be judged and excommunicated from God's people. <clears throat> the beginning date for the 2,300 days or years of Daniel 8, 14 is given to us in Daniel 9, 24 and 26. Here, two subdivisions of the time period are mentioned, the 69 weeks and the 70 weeks, that were cut off from the longer period of the 2,300 days, and we have discussed that in a previous lecture also. The beginning event mentioned here in these verses is the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, rebuild it. There was a decree issued by Cyrus, which I've mentioned previously, and one by Darius that allowed the Jews to start the rebuilding of the city. But only the third degree by Artaxerxes mentioned the restoration of Jerusalem and giving to them the establishment of a local administration system that allowed them to a full system of self-government and a legal system that allowed them to punish lawbreakers even to the death penalty. See Ezra 7, 25 and 26. The date for this degree we have established previously in history is 457 BC. Siegfried H. Horn and Lynn H. Wood produced a little book called The Chronology of Ezra 7, published in 1953 by Review and Herald Publishing Association. This date we have looked at in the previous lecture, and I've shown evidence to prove that the date is correct. From this beginning date, we arrive at 1844, at the end of the 2,300-day period, when Jesus would begin the pre-advent judgment in heaven, which would end with the blotting out of the record of the sins of God's people from the sanctuary in heaven, prior to the second coming. 
Willem Miller, who studied, he was a Baptist lay preacher, who studied the Bible prophecies uh, intently, uh, arrived at the date eventually of 1843 as the date for the end of the 2,300 days, and we've seen the reason why he said that. <clears throat> when Jesus did not come by the end of 1843, he thought the Jewish 2,300 year cycle would end in 1844 in the end of March, but that didn't happen either. But then they realized that the date actually extended to October 22, the day of Yom Kippur, according to the Karite calculation. And so that was the date that was fixed upon by the Advent movement. The Seventh Adventist Church see in the disappointment the experiences of the Advent awakening people led originally by William Miller and others that swept the world as being foretold in the prophecy of Revelation 10. In this prophecy, John was told to eat a little book that had been closed, but now was open. The only book ever closed, according to Scripture, is the little book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. But now we see the little book is open, and the angel told John to eat the book. Well, we don't eat books, but we do have an idiom in the English language where we say, I devoured a book. That means you read it and read it and read it intensely. And that's what is meant by eating the book. He was warned that it would be sweet in his mouth, but would be bitter in his stomach. And he recorded that that is exactly what happened to him. It was sweet in his mouth, but after it was bitter. The prophecy fits perfectly with what happened in history. When the early Advent believers studied the book of Daniel, they thought that Jesus was going to come in 1844 to cleanse the earth which they thought was the sanctuary that was to be cleansed. That anticipation was to them a sweet experience, but when Jesus did not come, it was a bitter disappointment. After the great disappointment of 1844, a small group of Advent believers came to understand that the sanctuary that was to be cleansed was not the earth, but in fact, a heavenly sanctuary, spoken about in the book of, of Hebrews in the New Testament. They began an earnest study of the Bible, especially the books of Leviticus and Hebrews. And then in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, they saw that there was going to be three worldwide messages symbolized by three angels flying in the midst of heaven, going to the whole world, announcing that the hour of his judgment is come. Not coming or will come, but is come, present tense. They also warn everyone that, that penalties will follow for those who reject God's call. These prophecies all came together into the message of the Seventh Adventist Church, which is now being preached worldwide. Let's have a look now at these messages in Revelation chapter 14, 6 and on. And I, John, saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. There followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. <coughs> Rich and poor, free and bond, are compelled to receive a mark in their forehead or in their forehands. And that no man might buy nor sell, say he that had the mark or the number of the beast. And it's given there details in Revelation 13. Now I read over further into Revelation 14 again. A third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And if he be tormented with fine brimstone, the presence of the Lord. And then it says in verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All right. The first angel's message speaks about a pure gospel. The second angel's message warns against a false 
gospel. And the third angel's message enables us to tell the difference between the true and the false. This is the way one scholar has summarized these three angel messages. The first angel preaches, talks about the pure gospel. The second angel warns against the false gospel. And the third angel tells us how to tell the difference between the two, the true and the false. The first angel speaks about a worldwide preaching of the everlasting gospel. That is the unchanging gospel. The gospel that has never changed, for God only has one way of saving human beings. And that is through the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross, which we have discussed before. He died the death that every sinner should die. As Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We cannot find salvation in any other way. It also tells us that the gospel is to go to every person without regard to nationality or language. It is to be preached universally. It also calls for all to worship and reverence God because the hour of his judgment has come. The early pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church believed that this proclamation was now possible in light of the truths as they had discovered. Daniel 8 and 9 and Leviticus 16, as we have explained previously, they believed that a judgment was now going on in heaven, commencing on that date. This for them became present truth. It could not have been preached before 1844. Notice that the Apostle Paul, when talking to Felix, spoke about the day of judgment that was still future. Acts 24 verse 25 is therefore had not begun in AD 31 when Jesus ascended to heaven as some have tried to teach, as we have mentioned before. The first angel's message also calls upon the inhabitants of the world to worship God as the creator. The only real way in which we can do this is to observe the memorial of creation which he has instit instituted for us to keep, the seventh day Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Hence the Sabbath day is clearly still binding upon Christians as can be shown in many other Bible passages. It is thus very clear that our early pioneers saw the three angels' message as being very relevant to the needs of society of their day. And they proclaimed these messages with power and used them to justify the setting up of a new worldwide movement because no other group or denomination in Christendom was teaching these truths. The year 1844, the year that immediately followed, we're in the 19th century, but the world has changed dramatically since then. The question many could ask today is this. Are the three angels' messages still relevant for us today who are living in the 21st century? During the years since the pioneers preached these messages, many new teachings and philosophies have arisen and thousands, if not millions of people, have been drawn away from Bible truth as a result. In the remaining pages of this chapter or the remaining minutes of this lecture, I propose to look at some of those teachings that have arisen and show that they are answered by the teachings of the three angels, and thus show that they are relevant for us today, if not more so than they were when our pioneers first preached them. Let us now see how these messages answer the false teachings and philosophies that are in our world today. Each Bible quote will provide the answer to the false teachings that follow. First of all, we'll take the phrase, fear God and give worship to him, glory to him, worship him. That answers atheism, which says there is no God. You can't give glory to God if you believe in atheism. Agnosticism teaches that I do not know if there is a God, not as definite as the atheist who claims there is no God. The agnostic says, I don't know if there is a God. And the skeptic who says, I doubt that there is a God. Three different approaches to the question of denial. Rationalism 
also is denied here. Rationalism teaches that the highest form of intelligence is the human mind, and that the only things that can be known are those that the mind can understand. So spiritual things beyond the comprehension of the human mind are ruled out. Infidelity teaches similar ideas and is thus another name for unbelief. What about self-worship? This is a form of idolatry. As someone has said, the self-made man worships his creator. Self-worship. And many people indulge in that kind of practice. Then we have materialism, which teaches that uh, material things are the most important <clears throat> in the lives of men and women. They place more value on them than they do on God. And of course, idolatry is the worship of idols made from any material. Many heathen make images of wood and stone and gold and silver and other things and worship them as God. The worship of any false god is answered by the wording to worship the true God. Then we have the expression, the everlasting gospel. This answers many, many false gospels, false religious teachings. Let's look at some of them. Dispensationalism. This is the theological term that divides the human history into different ages, usually seven of them, and that God deals with human beings in different ways in various time periods. Its people are saved in different ways by different methods in different times. For example, from the time of Moses to the cross, it's the dispensation of law. And people were or could be saved by their law keeping or by their works. But that since the cross, salvation is by grace and not by works. This, of course, is a false teaching because there is only one way whereby we can be saved and that's through the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice. Modernism. Modernism denies the inspiration of the Bible and says that it was written by men, ordinary men, who were not inspired. They wrote what they believed about God, and since it is only the thinking of men, we ought not to put too much value on what they said. What about religious liberalism? It's sometimes called or linked to modernism and says that obedience should not be stressed too much that the law was nailed to the cross, and that Christians today do not need to keep it. It is often referred to as cheap grace. I don't have to do anything because Jesus did it for me. Note that those who teach it usually only want to get rid of the seventh-day Sabbath, while holding that the other nine commandments ought to be kept. They sometimes say, oh, I do not have to keep the Sabbath for Jesus kept it for me. But what about the other commandments? Jesus kept them for you too. That doesn't give you license to steal or kill or commit adultery or do other things that are wrong. Then we look at legalism, which is the stressing of law keeping as a means of salvation. That is that we can earn our way to heaven. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us clearly that salvation is a gift from God. For by grace are ye saved, it says, and not through your works. Verse 9 says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, a gift from God cannot be earned. You cannot earn a gift. If you earn something, it's wages. The wage of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life, we are told in Scripture. And all of us can accept God's gift if we put out our hand and by faith accept it. If our works were completed, available for us to give some credit to us, even partly to enhance our chance of salvation, it would be unfair. Because as often pointed out, some people can do more work than others. What about the person with great talent? He can use his uh, intellectual gifts or whatever to do more for God than the person who is limited. What about the person who has great wealth? He can do more with his money than people like you and me who only have limited means. And what about the person who lives a long life? 
Many years of service that he can give to God compared with the youth who is cut down by some accident or illness when he's but a teenager. So it would become unfair if our works were the basis of our salvation or only part of our basis of our salvation. And God gives everybody a gift and that is available to all. So the ground at the foot of the cross, as some theologian has said, is level ground. No one has an advantage over others when it comes to the gift of God and salvation. What about all Eastern and non-Christian religions? What they teach? <clears throat> they do not come under the umbrella of the everlasting gospel because they have various teachings there that exclude the gospel that we find in the scriptures. What about pantheism? Form of naturalism? When I was a boy, I heard my father talk about pantheism, particularly in connection with Kellogg's apostasy. And I didn't know what pantheism was, I was just a lad. So I said to my father, what is pantheism? And he explained it to me that pantheism is the teaching that God is in everything. Well, that's uh, one way of explaining it, but uh, we Christians do have a doctrine that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere present in his creation. What is the difference then between omnipresence doctrine of God and the pantheistic concept of God? The pantheistic concept of God is that God is a part of nature. You see, God can be in nature, but he's not a part of nature. He's present in it, but he's not part of it. He created it. You can't be part of something that he created. That is the difference. It's like drawing a circle and putting nature in the middle of the circle. And it, say, God is inside the circle. He's part of nature. Therefore, nature is supreme. Nature's laws are supreme. And God, if there is a God in nature, he has to have a small g, not a capital G. And he cannot change nature. Therefore, miracles do not happen in the view of the pantheist. They rule out miracles. Now, you see now where we would have ended up as a church if we had followed Kenwright's uh, uh, pantheism years ago. It has to rule out creation, substituted with evolution. It has to rule out the virgin birth, because it's a miracle. All the miracles of the Bible must be denied. And what about the resurrection? That's another miracle. You rule out that. And what have you left to believe? Nothing worth believing. So the doctrine of pantheism is ruled out by the everlasting gospel which says that God is there and he is the one who's providing salvation for us. Pantheism is another term that is used with a God with a small g who is a part of nature. Now come to another doctrine that's been promoted in Christianity called neo-orthodoxy. You see, years ago, the liberals went so far with their teaching about modernism that they ruled out virtually that there was no God. And there came a reaction against that. And a group of scholars known as the neo-orthodox branch decided that they couldn't go down the road of the liberals that far so they tried to bring the church back and said that uh, their movement was a reaction to the teachings of the liberals. New orthodoxy brought God back, but not to proper orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy taught that the Bible is not God's word, but it contains God's word. Notice the difference? The Bible is not God's word, but it contains God's word. And you have to find what God's word is by studying it. And of course, you come up with your view of what God's word is, and others come up with different views, and so you still get confusion. For example, the record of creation in the book of Genesis. They say, don't follow the book of Genesis in detail. Those details are irrelevant. The truth in the book of Genesis is behind the details. The truth is that somehow God is responsible for the world and the universe being here, but we don't know the method. We don't know how. We don't accept seven literal days, but God is somehow, maybe he used the process of evolution to develop things. So they still believe in a God, but they put him in a box, limiting his power, and deny the plain teachings of Scripture. That's a summary of neo-orthodoxy. It allows human wisdom, so-called, to interpret God's word to suit human thinking. 
What about futurism? I gave you a lecture on futurism recently, and that interprets Bible prophecies. It came out of the Council of Trent, as we saw, and denies the interpretation of prophecies that the, the reformers were teaching, and uh, took the blame off the papacy, which was the preaching of the reformers, and traitorism, another which we've already looked at in detail. And both these teachings of prophetic interpretation are answered by the everlasting gospel. Arianism. Arianism is another heresy that's going around the world, and there are some Christians who believe it. It teaches that uh, Jesus is not fully God, but that God created him. He is not pre-eternal in his existence with the Father. There came a time when he was created. Some even are teaching that the Father gave birth to him in some way we do not understand, and I've heard that propounded by some. And uh, we cannot follow that either. The everlasting gospel is the gospel of the triune personality of the Godhead, but it's one God and uh, in three persons. Then the doctrine of Mormonism, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They uh, teach their doctrines largely out of the Book of Mormon, which they regard as almost as divinely inspired, perhaps equal with the Bible. They have many teachings that are far-fetched from the Bible, of course. For example, they teach that God was once a man like us, that he went through a period of human probation, Adam, and died and then became God. And that uh, when we die, we can become gods. But we'll always be behind God. As we climb the hierarchy, God is always ahead of us. We never catch up to him. But we will become gods one day too. Then we have the New Age teaching that has come into the Western world in recent years and seemed to appeal to many, especially in those in the alternate culture of the hippie community and so on. And even some who have no faith at all. In its teaching, it closely resembles some non-Christian religions and seems to promote the idea of reincarnation. It's certainly not based on the Bible. Then we have another wording that we have in the three angels' messages. The hour of his judgment is come. Is that still a relevant message for today? Well, it answers existentialism. Existentialism is a doctrine of philosophy that teaches that there is no God and no ultimate purpose in life. There is nothing outside of ourselves. We are alone in the universe. Life is meaningless, pointless and absurd. Well, no wonder so many, many people commit suicide if they go down that road because they see no meaning in life. So what is the purpose of it all? <clears throat> Situation ethics. Philosophy says that every action, <clears throat> even actions that are forbidden in Scripture, may be justified if the situation calls for it. This leaves open to the possibility that one may rationalise away his sinful behaviour and leave man without a moral code of any kind by which to live. Humanism. Humanism teaches that man is supreme and really has no need for God. It used to teach that man is becoming better year by year <coughs> and that this process uh, would continue until the utopia is reached. This philosophy has suffered a substantial setback as a result of two world wars. And people have seen in the carnage of these wars that human nature is not able to achieve a utopia that they hope for. But it's actually becoming worse as time goes on. Pragmatism is another philosophy that needs to be defined. It teaches that truth is determined by its end consequences. It was a philosophy promoted by two educationalists in the United States of America around the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s. Their names were J. Dewey and W. James. Dewey and James promoted pragmatism. What, does it form, what format does it take? Well, truth is determined by its end consequences may be explained by saying, if it works, then it is right. And Mao Zedong, the famous Chinese uh, communist leader, further expressed the philosophy in the words, 
Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. You have a barrel of a gun and you can shoot your enemies, that works. Eliminate your enemies, it works, then you have power. Some have said that this philosophy has brought much grief to the world. Then we have the permissiveness or the new morality, as it's sometimes called. It allows its followers to live without any sense of obligation to obey God's laws, or any law for that matter. They follow the saying, if it feels good, then do it. Some call it the new morality, but in reality it should be called the old immorality. Deism, a doctrine that teaches that God created the world and then left it on its own, has nothing more to do with it. He is like an absentee landlord. If that is so, then there is no way that he will in the future get involved in the judgment so people are left to do as they please without regard to any future reckoning or accounting of their actions. Antinomianism is answered. It comes from two Greek words, anti against and nomos, the law. This is a teaching that God's law has been abolished. Some say nailed to the cross. So we do not need to keep it. Of course, they use this argument to get rid of the obligation to keep the seventh day Sabbath, as I've mentioned previously. This teaching leads people to live as if there is no law, and thus there is no future judgment. Predestination, sometimes called Calvinism, is another doctrine. Calvinism, of course, is, is based on the John Calvin, the great Protestant reformer, who taught that the human being do not have a choice when it comes to salvation. The Bible teaches that human beings do have a choice as to whether they accept or reject God's people. Calvin said no. He maintained that God was sovereign and he made the decision as to who will be saved and who will be lost. That means that if God has decided the man will be lost, he will be lost even though he might want to be saved. This teaching is still the official position of those churches that follow Calvin and theology, mainly what they call the Reformed Churches in Europe and the Presbyterian Church that was founded in Scotland by John Scott who was uh, also a follower of Calvin. However, in recent years, they have not been stressing this doctrine of predestination so much, for it is not looked upon with favour by many people today that you don't have a choice. Fatalism is whatever <clears throat> somewhat related to predestination in its outcome. It says that everything is life is decided for us, and there is nothing we can do to change anything. What will be, will be. We are powerless to alter anything, including, of course, the question of our own salvation. Then they have the doctrine of universalism, that if the doctrine is the doctrine teaching that eventually everyone is going to be saved and no one will be lost. This is certainly not the teaching of the Bible. This teaching makes a mockery of the idea of a future judgment. Then we have the second chance doctrine, and many Christians have gone down this road. It teaches that there will be in some future time, future life, another chance for us to choose to serve God. So don't worry too much about now because you get another chance later on. The Bible does not teach this, but declares, and I quote 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, now is the day of salvation. Don't look for a second chance. The danger of this doctrine is that many will not choose to serve God until it is too late and therefore will miss out. Then we come to the question of postmodernism, a very popular philosophy in recent years. It teaches that there is no absolute truth and that every individual can decide for himself or herself what will be their truth. The saying is, I'm right, you are right. It reflects this way of thinking. This, of course, completely undermines the authority of the Bible and certainly denies what Jesus said in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The end result of this teaching is that people claim that there are many ways to God and salvation which again is contradicted by the words of Jesus, 
This way of thinking has given rise to more toleration for the views of others. But recently, post-modernist has lost some of its former following because of the actions of some fanatical followers of religion who have persecuted those who are not agreeing with them. Then we come to another philosophy that is currently going around called secular orthodoxy. It is the name recently given to some teaching that uh, have been around for some years. It grows out of the evolution, uh, elevation rather, of science and the mocking of Bible-based religion. It says, I'm an informed and ethical person and you are a fool holding on to fables long since proven nonsense by science and moral positions that are simply bigotry wrapped up in religion. This leads to the rejection of any Bible standards of right and wrong that society does not want to follow, and those who still adhere to them are marginalised. That's a quote from James Standish in the article Rethink, taken from the South Pacific Record of August 10, 2014. Quite recent, really. Now we come to some more words in the three angels' messages. First of all, God made the heaven and the earth. This answers evolution or Darwinism. It denies the first angel's message which calls upon the inhabitants to worship the, of, the, to, of the world to worship God as the creator. This is very relevant to our age where most of the Western world no longer believes in the Bible account of creation. Those who accept the theories of evolution, of course, have no basis for the Bible Sabbath that God gave to mankind as a weekly reminder that he created the world and all that is in it. Even theistic evolution leaves no basis for the Sabbath. For if each day of creation week is not 24 hours, as the Bible says, but thousands of years, then there is no logic for a 24-hour Sabbath at the end of the creation process. Then we have pantheism. Again, it does not believe in miracles. For in their world view, there is no law for it. And there is no one outside of nature able to change it. Since creation, is, since creation is a miracle, followers have no option but to deny creation and it places in its place evolution. The call to worship God as a creator is more relevant than ever before. Dualism is the belief that there are two opposing but equal gods. The Bible teaches that there is only one God and he is the creator. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Then we have the false Sabbath. The call to worship God as the creator is, of course, a call to observe the true Bible Sabbath and not the first day of the week. This is very relevant for our times when most of the Christian world worship on a counterfeit day. Then we read another wording from the three angels' messages. Preaching the gospel to them that dwell on the earth, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This rules out national pride and exclusiveness. It's, op it's opposite of what the Bible teaches. The, God is the, <clears throat> the Bible teaches when God said the gospel is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. No language group is to be excluded. For God is no respecter of persons, Acts chapter 10, verse 34. It rules out racism. Racism has no place in God's church, nor the practice of any form of racial discrimination. Unfortunately, this has not always been practiced as it should have been in history. There have been years when some people would not work for the salvation of others of a different race considering them to be under God's curse and therefore they could not be saved. Fortunately, some who used to be so minded have since abandoned their former beliefs and practices in that regard. And then, of course, ethnic cleansing, the horrible practice that some races have embarked upon plans to exterminate other races. You think of what Hitler did to the Jews in World War II, with his concentration camps and the gas chambers, Auschwitz, Belsen, and other concentration camps. Some years ago, I visited Auschwitz in Poland, and I saw things there that were, make you weep. 
when thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were gassed to death in an attempt to exterminate a whole race of people. Certainly, when we consider all that has been presented in this talk, we must conclude that the three angels' messages are very relevant for us today in the modern world. How thankful we should be that God has in these last days called out a people to take these three angels' messages, his last warning message, to the world. May God help us to do our part in making that a reality. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.